Hello everyone, welcome to another video where we keep exploring the less known work of Mobius and in particular his short stories. And for today, exactly like in the previous video, I went ahead and translated his personal notes and interview snippets where he talks about his thoughts and uh, thought process and backstory behind each of these works so that we can really get that deep dive into what he was thinking and how he created them. If you've not seen the first video of this series, you can do so at this link, where I go through The Long Tomorrow, Rock City, Approaching Centauri, and a bunch of others. All right, let's dive in. So for today's video, I have another Italian oversized hardcover from 1990, and this volume collects the following. We have The White Citadel, we have Dema, Ballad, Free Fall, The Apple Pie, The White Nightmare, A Tale of Christmas, and finally Cthulhu. What I like about this book is that it is a collection of stories that has nothing to do with science fiction, which is the genre that usually makes up the majority of his catalogue. Instead, it focuses on the fantastic, the world of dreams and the subconscious. According to Mobius, this group of stories were born by chance as a result of encounters or readings that were done outside of his usual creative circle. And this is how he talks about it. It is not healthy for an author to only hang out in environments with people who are only interested in comics. Little by little, the author will end up believing he's a superstar. But this is only an illusion. While meeting people you admire but who have never read a comic in their lives puts things back in order. Sometimes it's not an easy experience, but it ends up being a very beneficial one to the author. And this small introduction uh, I think is the perfect segue into the first story of this book, which is The White Citadel. created in 1980 and six pages long. It tells of a medieval knight which, while traveling through the forest, encounters a strange citadel without doors nor windows. Here he meets the last elf of the same forest, who reveals to the knight that the citadel is in fact a meteor falling from the sky, carved this way by his people. The citadel initially had doors and windows, but because of a curse, these were shut. The knight then falls asleep and dreams of that same ancient legend to awake the morning after, alone and roaming the forest, mute, deaf and blind, as the citadel itself. And I need to add that the original title for this story was not the White Citadel, but the Blind Citadel as it has no doors, no windows. So I'm not sure why, why the English translation chose to go in a different direction, but it feels to me that this is an important piece of the puzzle to make, to make more sense of the story. Regardless, here is what Mobius tells us about how he created this tale. I studied spirituality with Jean-Paul Appel Guéry, along with a group of people who had never opened a comic book. When they saw that I was drawing, they immediately pointed out to me that the often morbid, hopeless, negative aspect of my stories. It was somewhat, I was somewhat ashamed of it and tried to change, to prove that I was capable of other things. At the time, I had a friend who read the, the King Arthur stories and assured me that they were great. It seemed to me as a good idea to embark into a vast epic that would trace the steps of the Knights of the Round Table with elves, goblins, the Grail, and all the bells and whistles. I began to work on the Citadel, but uh, as you can see, the story developed in ways other than what I had planned. My unconscious began to wander, and once again, I conceived the story with a cruel ending. When I told my friends 
that had drawn a knight's tail, they were very excited. But when they saw the result, they laughed and decided that I was definitely hopeless. And that is what Mobius had to say about the White Citadel. I would like to add some context to what he means when he talks about the negative, morbid side of some of his stories. He mentioned this in, in several occasions, specifically referring to the fact that many of his shorter tales end with the death of the protagonists. And this stems from two things. One is that this is simply a gimmick, which, he, which gives him the power to end any story for which he had not really thought about an epilogue. And this is tightly dependent on the improvisational nature of Mobius' way of working, where he would start a story but not know where it would lead. And the other cause for this was that these stories were created during a period of his life which was particularly dark and that inevitably reflected into his work. And this then actually changed thanks to the meditation um, journey he took and his quest for spirituality which he did together with his guru, uh, Jean-Paul Appelguerri, as he mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago. All right, moving on, we have Dema, which is three pages long. And Dema is set in a desert where the titular character is chased by an enemy thirsty for vengeance. Dema escapes through the desert into a pyramid where she prepares to confront this masked man but in a classic Mobius twist, the enemy changes his mind after reaching Damus' abandoned tent and chatting to his mount while resting. Mobius does not talk about this story in, in any notes or anything that I could find, but what we can see here is the use of the desert as a set piece. The desert is, uh, in fact, a recurring theme in his work and his fascination with it originates very early on in his life during his stay in Mexico as a young man while visiting his mother who lived there. Symbolically, the desert can carry different meanings, but the most important one, in my opinion, is how this ties to the spiritual aspect of Mobius and his internal search and spiritual growth. The desert is a place where you are often alone, isolated, where you have time to explore yourself and a place where revelation and transformation can happen, but also a place you need to cross and not stay in. In a way, you could argue that all of Mobius' career has been a journey through the desert, where often alone, he's been pushing the boundaries of what comics are and where they can go. Okay, that was Dame. Moving on, we have Ballad. And Ballad is a story, uh, it's from 1977, sorry, and it's nine pages long. And it's a story inspired by the poem Flowers of Arthur Rimbaud. It is the tale of a traveler who is exploring a lush forest and while camping one night gets attacked by a beast. But the female fawn magically saved his life and the explorer convinced her to follow him and leave the forest behind as the world is full of wonders and worth exploring. But they soon meet other armed men who, without hesitation, fire upon the two, abruptly ending their journey. Here is uh, what Mobius had to say about this. Ballad was born from a book I read. While living in Paris, I used to sit at a coffee table with my science fiction books or poem collections, and one day I bought Rimbaud Illuminations and read the first few pages. It was magnificent. Then the book stayed on a shelf in my library for at least a year, until the day when, having to draw a story for heavy metal, I find myself out of ideas. So I resorted to an old trick. And a note from me, uh, this was a trick that Jodorowsky taught him uh, for when you're creatively stranded or blocked and don't know into which direction to move your story. So, back to Mobius' notes. In those cases, you have to empty your spirit, randomly reach out to one of your books and open it. There lies a strong chance that you will find your narrative solution. Back then, my fingers landed on that book from the cafe, 
and I open it on the poem called Flowers. The images came by themselves. After drawing the first few pages, I wanted to continue. But I had a deadline, so I opted for that horrible simplification, which is to make your heroes die in a surprising, unexpected and often bizarre way. It is scary. I have practiced this kind of abomination too many times and I'm sorry for it. I would like to fix this, to show that these are only petty tricks and that those characters are still alive somewhere. And again, Mobius mentions this trick of his uh, killing off his characters when out of time or ideas. Something that we will see over and over again, but I must say that this is not always done in a negative, bleak way. Many times this is also done with humor, like for example in uh, It's a Small Universe or in Blackbeard and the Pirate Brain, both of which you can see in my previous video. Okay, moving on we have an interesting one, we have Free Fall. Um, original title was Absoluten Kalfutrail. Um, I say this because it matters. Um, the story is from 1977 and it's eight pages long. It's about a man who is running from something, we don't know what, and trips and falls into a gaping hole in the ground for what seems like an eternity. And his landing will have some sort of atomic effect. So here's what Mobius had to say about it. Free fall is well representative of a period in which I was looking for more creative freedom by drawing directly with ink and without pencils or script. This method allows for relatively brutal directional changes. The, pledge, the pleasure which comes from executing a panel in such a way can lead to unforeseen bifurcations in the story. I have worked like this for years, so much so that this process has more or less become my trademark. And a note from me on the title, um, which in the original associates absolu, which means completely or totally, and calfutre, which means shut or sealed. So not really free fall, that's the English translation, but, ri but rather completely sealed or completely airtight, if you want. And this is important for what Mobius had to say next. Okay, so back to him. This story presents two things. One is that it is, uh, in a way, another variant of the airtight garage, where the story unfolds in a sealed space and moves across layers. The other is the theme of falling, which came naturally as I was drawing it and ties to something that I lived very intensely at the time. Back then, a psychologist friend interpreted this within a classic therapeutic scheme, the symbolic representation of an inner landscape of neurosis and dreams. Overall, poorly encrypted by the form I chose to give it in my drawings. And indeed, Mobius is precisely this, its inner exploration. And this explains why, even in different forms, uh, my favorite char character is the Traveler, the Explorer, like Arzak or Major Grubert, the Star Watcher. All are wandering characters, and they cross the path that I myself has borrowed, and each of them represents a part of myself. Arzak is the Explorer of Dreams. Grubert, instead, is the personification of the ridiculous inhibitions that come from my social conditioning. All designers produce these kind of personal projections, but rational imperatives often mask our true essence. Next we have the apple pie from 1977. It's four pages long. It's a story about the dawn of sexuality and the projections and dreams that come with it. Here is what Mobius had to say about it. This was a story I created for Art Nana, a magazine fully run by women. My wife was one of the editors there, and it was she who gave me the initial idea. 
the development on two or three pages of a little but very poisonous female ghost. Later, I applied a personal dream interpretation to it, integrating pseudo-American references, which now, seen from here, add a tone of poetry to it. Next we have uh, The White Nightmare uh, from 1974, 12 pages long. This is a short but intense tale about racism, anger and social isolation. The, the White Nightmare is, in my opinion, one of the most powerful stories in his catalogue. It's brutal, it's realistic and, and a complete departure from the fantastical tales we're, we're so used to reading. The story follows a Moroccan immigrant who is cycling to work when a bunch of racists in a car spot him and fail to run him over, causing a car accident, but rapidly escalating and spiralling out of control as the assailants try to contain the situation on the streets, which quickly draws too much unwanted attention, including the one of a chief of police, which puts an end to the madness. But all is suddenly revealed to be a nightmare from which the leader of the gang awakens distressed, his sleep ruined by the prospect of a missed beating. Our character then descends into the streets and into his car, for real this time, with his buddies, to relive the same scenario that played out in his dream, and this time succeeding in his assault. The White Nightmare is therefore the dream of the white man, a dream of violence and power, where distress is born of the possibility that all of this can be taken away from him, where just still, justice sorry, still has the power to stop his racism and where people still have a conscience. That is his White Nightmare. But simultaneously, reality is also a nightmare for the victims who have to live in it. And here are Mobius's words. White Nightmare is the product of indignation. One morning, while shaving, I heard on the radio that a short film highlighting racist incidents had been censored by the Ministry of Home Affairs. I thought this was an outrageous scandal and immediately decided to create a story which followed the same theme. I did this to, expre to express my solidarity towards both the victims of racism and the young director who was censored. In my version, I tried to put myself in the shoes of all characters, to identify with them, including the Moroccan man, to show all of the horror, the idiocy behind those behaviours. Initially, I wanted to make a very straightforward story, then instead I came up with the idea of pushing it off balance by injecting the dream of all those who want a more peaceful and accepting world therefore making it the nightmare of the racists, the white nightmare. And uh, a quick note from me, um, this story actually became a short movie in the early 90s, um, so you can actually track it down and check it out online. Next we have A Tale of Christmas from 1977, and it's three pages long and follows two hunters on a strange planet looking for what is called a Lippon, a strange winged creature that is traditionally served as a roast for Christmas. The roles of hunter and hunted are suddenly inverted as the creatures on this planet decide to revolt and declare open the hunting season on humans. Here are Mobius notes on it. A Christmas Tale is a request that came from Metal Hurlant uh, for their December 1977 issue. Uh, starting from angels as a main theme, I soon started thinking of other winged creatures of a very different kind. The turkeys sacrificed for Christmas lunches and dinners, and more broadly, all birds slaughtered by, hunt slaughtered by hunters. Raising birds and then freeing them in front of a hunter's gun has always seemed like a dreadful practice to me. 
I wanted to switch the roles, turn the animals against the hunters, offer the victims a chance to prevent the crime from being carried out. The problem with this is that there is nonetheless a crime in reverse. If I were to do this story again, I would choose to no longer open the eyes of the hunters by using a deadly trap, but I would try to open their eyes and their minds with the spiritual means instead. And I was turning the page a bit too early there, sorry about that. Uh, because next we have Cthulhu from 1978, five pages long. And Cthulhu is one of his most famous short stories. Uh, what I personally love about it is the plasticity of the coloring. It has so much depth, but also shows how incredibly skilled Moebius is at crafting short stories beyond this technical ability of you know, drawing and, and coloring. He is just amazing at setting the stage in a couple of panels and really trimming the fat of the narrative to make sure that you know exactly who is who and what is going on by the first page. You know. um, Cthulhu follows a prime minister with a bit of a hunting fetish for sacred creatures and as Mobius calls them, <laughs> and we see him leaving one last meeting before the Easter holidays to then go alone to some obscure lower level where the hunting party is waiting for him. The doors open and they meet Lovecraft on a throne, which points them to the Cthulhu they are there to hunt. And here are Mobius' words. I was very impressed by reading Lovecraft's books especially the case of Charles Dexter Ward and the color out of space. Reading them, I was not fully aware of the interplay of underground energies that those stories conveyed. I limited myself to endorsing the opinions that many of my friends had of him, according to which Lovecraft was actually a god and my friend uh, Philippe Troilet one of his prophets. In Cthulhu, it was not difficult to in integrate the Lovecraftian mythology, given that it has a system of precise references known to a large enough audience for a quote to be understood and work as a gag. In the story, I then made a connection with, the, uh, with an anecdote that shocked me at the time, the one that uh, French president Valéry Giscard would slack on his duties to hunt and kill animals in Africa. However, I did not directly take Giscard as prey. First, because he would have forced me to make caricatures, which I hate. And secondly, because my natural prudence prevented me from going too far in a personal attack without knowing all of the details of these events. So I limited myself to creating a humorous fairy tale. And that was Cthulhu, the last one of this book. And um, again, thank you so much for watching. This was The White Citadel and other tales. And um, yeah, stay tuned for more because there will be more. I'll be carrying on and going through my library and catalogue to dig out other books like this with short story collections and um, other stories also that have not been translated to English yet, for example, um, like Arzak, The Surveyor, etc. So yeah, stay tuned and thanks for watching. See you next time.